control. And it's wonderful to have Warren uh, Bennington, Professor Bennington here. Um, I would like to invite now the Honorable Justice John Sullan of the Supreme Court of South Australia to introduce the Honorable Alexander Downer AC. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is with great pleasure uh, that I introduce the Honorable Alexander Downer AC as the first presenter in a series of lectures and seminars on the aspect of ma on the subject matter of reconciliation. As you would be aware, this series will be held over the next seven weeks and consider conflicts and reconciliation in various parts of the world. The speakers and participants are all of a high quality and the sessions should attract much interest. On behalf of the Abraham Institute, I acknowledge the initiative and hard work of those who have uh, put this uh, series of seminars together and they've been mentioned this evening. And I thank them for the work they've done in doing so. Tonight we're honoured to hear Alexander Downer AC, who was appointed by the Secretary General of the United Nations as a special envoy on Cyprus and who will present on the topic of truth and reconciliation in Cyprus. Mr Downer needs no introduction and I do not intend to speak at length about his many achievements. I do mention, however, that he is a true South Australian and has, a long, has long family ties in South Australia. His family has a long history of public service to the Australian community. Prior to entering Parliament, Mr Downer held a number of senior positions in government and in the private sector. He entered Parliament as the member for Mayo in 1984 he has a Bachelor of Arts Honours Degree in Politics and Economics and is a Doctor of Civil Laws Honoris Causa. He also holds a Doctor of Philosophy from the Bar Ilan University. During his tenure as Foreign Minister, he's been involved in numerous roles in various parts of the world. He played a significant role in delivering independence in East Timor. He's been involved in Australia's response to the Middle East conflicts. He has been a tireless supporter on the issue of human rights throughout the world and is probably one of the best known Australian polit politicians throughout the world. Since leaving politics, Mr Downer has been involved in a number of roles, including his appointment by the Secretary General of the United Nations as Special Envoy on Cyprus. He is about to take up the, the role of High Commissioner to the United Kingdom and I congratulate him on that, that uh, appointment. Clearly, Mr Downer has a deep insight into the conflicts in Cyprus, and I have pleasure in asking him now to speak to us on the subject of truth and reconciliation in Cyprus. Well, thanks um, very much, John, for that introduction. It's uh, very much appreciated, and it's always a great pleasure for me to come back to the university and I've stood in this very spot here and given many lectures over the last five and a half years. I might surprise some of you but uh, I have hugely enjoyed my time as a professor of uh, politics and international trade here at Adelaide University. I uh, never realised I would enjoy teaching quite as much as I did. I can see being an academic is rather a delightful way to spend your life. But they complain a lot, <laughs> and it's interesting how little they get paid, I think. It's uh, quite an interesting, um, interesting issue. Um, I um, think uh, Cyprus is actually a very good case study to um, get you all to think about truth and reconciliation. Well, um, both of those things, truth and reconciliation, separating them apart. Um, to think about reconciliation in a more dramatic way than we might think about it here in, in Australia. We um, talk of reconciliation here, obviously, in the context of um, the Indigenous Australians and the respect we need to, we non-Indigenous Australians need to show those people um, and looking at ways of working together better and in a more respectful way than has been the case through much of our modern history since 1788. Um, but um, in most parts of the world, um, the issue of reconciliation, truth and reconciliation, 
is an issue about how do you stabilise conflict societies. Um, and Cyprus is a fascinating case study of a conflict society. There are plenty of others, the Middle East just next door, the Palestine, Israel issue just next door um, uh, is also a, a very good example. You can go to Kashmir and have a look at that and so the list goes on. But Cyprus um, tells you a lot about the challenges, um, particularly that people like the United Nations face, um, in trying to reconcile two conflicting sides um, and how to build bridges between them. Um, and the role of truth in all of that is, it, it is in and of itself a very interesting issue. You could give a whole lecture just on the question of truth, of what is truth. I know I sound very postmodern saying that. And by the way, I'm not remotely postmodern, as most of you can guess, um, but it does sound very postmodern to say that. Um, so um, let me start off by making um, a couple of very general points based on my experience, not just as the um, special advisor to the Secretary General um, in Cyprus, um, but over my years as a foreign minister where I had a lot of uh, experience in dealing with complex societies in Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, Bougainville, um, East Timor, Indonesia, Aceh in particular, um, and so the list goes on. So, um, first of all, as the special, the special advisor to the Secretary General doesn't mean much to you, it sounds as though I could just drop over there to New York and occasionally give the Secretary General a bit of advice um, that's not actually what happens at all. Special advisers are the people who do the job for the Secretary General. I mean, imagine the Secretary General of the United Nations can't be running the conflict in uh, dealing with the conflict in, in Congo, in the Central African Republic, in the Middle East, Cyprus, um, and so the list goes on. He appoints special advisers who are the people who manage if you like reconciliation in those particular places for him and report back to him every six months or so in New York, uh, but in particular report to the Security Council. So notionally, uh, my boss wasn't the Secretary General of the United Nations, my boss was the United Nations Security Council. That's the subject of another lecture. Um, students here in international relations have heard me give lectures on the, um, the Security Council of the United Nations. Um, I actually think it's very easy to be a little glib about conflict because we don't live in a conflict society. Um, it's easy to um, fall into the trap of mouthing empty platitudes and cliches, uh, of being banal in talking about conflict. This whole notion that there are goodies and there are baddies um, and usually we come to that conclusion fairly fast. Um, I think sometimes a little too fast. Um, I certainly think that in the case of Syria. Um, and um, it's very interesting to look at what's happening in Ukraine at the moment as well. Um, um, and um, well, this isn't to talk about those issues, um, but these are not as simple as these issues are not as simple as you might think, and nor is the Cyprus issue, nor is the Middle East issue, or the Kashmir issue, whichever one you want to choose. Um, so uh, the first observation I would make is this. Um, conflict societies are in conflict because of something I do know a lot about, politics. At the heart of conflict in conflict societies is politics. So people in countries like this, which lives in almost perfect peace compared to most countries in the world, whose approach to dealing with conflict societies is to say, you people, you just need to learn to get on with each other better. Stop this squabbling. Stop this fighting. Your voice is not heard. Your voice is not heard. That means nothing to them at all. If you go to Cyprus, and you say to people in Cyprus, I mean, look, it's quite simple. There are Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots, and you know, we're all, you know, God's people. Um, we should all be able to live together in perfect harmony. They're not even listening to you. They're not even listening to you. It is, as I, as I said, banal um, to uh, to make those sorts of comments. I mean, I'll say this. Um, I know this is being recorded, but. 
Um, the Secretary General of the United Nations um, often says when conflicts erupt, oh, we shouldn't be doing this, this I call for peace. Um, of course he should, um, and I'm glad he does, I'm saying he shouldn't do that. But I just want to, to um, impress upon you um, that that is, is not of itself going to end a conflict. Conflicts are based on politics. You get conflicts in democratic societies and you get them in non-democratic societies in between the two. In the case of Cyprus, both sides of that conflict are uh, leadership of both sides of that conflict are democratically elected. So um, uh, it's just worth thinking about that and it helps to reinforce um, that point. Um, when I um, first arrived in Cyprus, which is almost exactly <coughs> six years ago, now I've never been there before, came there from New York, I turned up in, uh, in Nicosia um, and I met with the UN people there. Um, now what would be the first question you would ask and what was the first question I asked having thought about this Cyprus issue of the UN people working there who were dealing with the Cyprus conflict. Um, you think about that for a minute. What's the first question you would ask? Would you say, why don't, you re why don't these people reconcile? Um, why don't we get them to apologise to each other? I did actually once say that in uh, Cyprus um, to, to great uh, um, applause from a tiny percentage of Liberals. Um, and huge condemnation from the Conservatives. Um, so, um, uh, I just make that point to you. The first question I asked was, what do the polls say? What do the public think about this issue? That was the first question I asked. Um, and they said, we haven't done any polling. And I said, well, if we don't know what the public think here, or we think we might know, but we're only guessing, uh, and it's just a sort of impression we have, um, then to be honest, I don't think we're going to be able to help. We're not going to be able to help at all. Um, so what I did was I um, took uh, some of our budget, um, our, our very small budget, um, and I invested it in some polling, uh, quite a lot of polling, quite a sophisticated, actually, polling uh, process. I got a professor from the University of Liverpool in the UK who's uh, renowned for the polling he's done in the Middle East amongst the Palestinians and the Israelis on the Middle East peace process. Um, and I brought him to Cyprus um, and he helped set up um, arrangements for polling in Cyprus um, and I had a look at what the public thought. Um, and, you know, um, this is what is, is so often the case. If you ask the public in a place like Cyprus, and this applies in many other conflict societies, what their preferred solution to the conflict they have um, is, well, it won't come as a surprise to you to be told um, that their two positions are irreconcilable. That is why there's a conflict. It's not that the politicians are weak or feckless or incompetent although some are, of course, as we well know, um, it's not just that. It's not about just that. Um, it's that they are being pushed into the positions they have. They probably got into the positions they're in because they listen to the public and because they can connect with the public. Um, so the, you, you want to think about what the public want. So in the case of Cyprus, um, let me just explain very uh, briefly um, what the scene is there. 80% of the population of that island, uh, which is about as big as um, the Adelaide Hills, Florio Peninsula and Kangaroo Island. I use that area uh, because I know exactly how big it is because it forms the electorate of Mayo, which I was the member of for 24 years. About 10,000 square kilometres, it's the size of, of Cyprus. Um, there are about a million people who live there. 80% of them, nearly 80% of them are Greek Cypriots um, and nearly all the rest are Turkish Cypriots. There are quite a lot of British people who live there for historic reasons, but, um, but um, essentially 20% of them, or around 20%, are Turkish Cypriots. Uh, Turkish Cypriots, just in case you um, are not aware, but I'm pretty sure you would be, are Muslims and obviously they speak Turkish. 
Greek Cypriots are um, well, Greek, they speak Greek, they're Greek Orthodox. Um, and they are relatively religious um, relative to the Turkish Cypriots, who although they are Muslims, um, they're not uh, very pious. They don't attend the mosques. The, um, Friday is a normal working day amongst Turkish Cypriots. So they are what you call in Turkey Kemalists. So, um, they are disciples of Kemal Ataturk, um, the founder of secular modern Turkey. That's where they come from. Um, I think they are probably, probably the most secular people in the Islamic world. Now here's something about reconciliation. Um, the, what's sometimes called the marriage outbreak. Um, so here in Australia, if you take Greek Australians and Anglo-Australians, um, the marriage out rate's very high. A lot of Greek Australians marry Anglos and so on. In, in fact, if you look at the marriage out rate of our indigenous community, it's quite high as well. I think it's sort of 40, 50 percent. Somebody, many of you know more, more about that than I do. That's, that gives you some hope, by the way. Not, there are cases of um, indigenous and non-indigenous people who love each other so much that they're prepared to get married um, and um, or become, you know, create a partnership and um, that helps with reconciliation. Um, of course, the marriage breaks down. Um, the um, marriage outrage in Cyprus over the last few centuries has been very, very close to zero. Turkish Cypriots, I mean, it seems to us almost incredible, this, and it's well worth thinking about it, but um, a Turkish Cypriot man will, will almost never want to marry a Greek Cypriot woman. I mean, I, I have to say, surely, being a man myself, um, if you were a young Turkish Cypriot male, wouldn't you observe young Greek Cypriot women um, and think the things that men sometimes think in, those, in that context? Apparently not, or if they do, um, this is a no-no for them. Um, and it's a very, very bad sign. When uh, Cyprus uh, Cypriots all lived together um, in villages and, and towns and cities in Cyprus, they lived together, but they didn't live together. Um, every village um, which had Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots in it had its Turkish Cypriot um, um, bars and uh, cafes. Uh, of course, they had a mosque, they had uh, their own schools, and the Greek Cypriots had all of that structure, churches, of course, instead of mosques as well. So the society um, is hugely divided, um, just on those lines. Um, the fact that Turkish Cypriots, um, uh, that, that Turkish Cypriots speak Turkish and Greek Cypriots um, speak Greek, and that the Greek Cypriots are 80% of the population, um, solved itself in terms of linguistics, and that was the Turkish Cypriots learnt Greek, um, because they're the minority. Uh, this, of course, was not psychologically very encouraging um, for the Turkish Cypriots over the years. It made them feel, because they're inferior in terms of numbers, um, but it made them feel socially inferior. Um, and there is a, a saying amongst Greek Cypriots that uh, we love the Turkish Cypriots as our brothers and our compatriots. And there's a saying amongst the Turkish Cypriots that um, the Greek Cypriots love us. They love us like you love your gardener. Um, so um, it makes you think a little bit about how difficult reconciliation can be. Um, so that is, if you like, um, the demographics of the place. Um, but it's also the politics of the place, and now we'll add a bit more life into the politics of Cyprus um, to help understand a little bit better um, uh, why this uh, society is so deeply divided. Um, and that extra bit that you add in, it's not just uh, demographics, it's history. You know, I say to students of politics here at this university, if you want to understand politics, there are two things, um, and we have a former Premier here, I think he might, uh, he might support this. If you want to understand politics, there are two things you must understand first. Um, one of those is economics, and the other is history. If you don't know anything about economics or history, 
Man, politics isn't for you. Or if you say I'm not interested in history, I'm interested in politics. That's ridiculous. That doesn't even make sense.